couple of quick reminders and a couple of scheduling things. Um, I think I put in an announcement that the design is due next week. I don't think that's the case. I think it's due the following week. I think it's due like the 8th uh, or something like that. So I, I, I kind of screwed up. And I didn't assign something due for next week because I thought your design was due for next week. So what I did is I shuffled around the due dates on a couple of things and I put in uh, another uh, assignment. So you now have an assignment due, I think the first, uh, the assignment that was due this week I changed to be due the first. Um, the uh, design for the project is due the 8th and then you have a new lab that is due the 10th of November that is. All right. Uh, one thing that we will probably do next week is we'll probably have some work days. I want to give people a chance to get caught up and uh, give people a chance to um, think about their project if they are caught up and do some design and do some work uh, on the project. Um, I've had people uh, in previous classes say something to the effect of, we haven't learned how to do this stuff yet. How can I design it? Which is somewhat of a valid concern. But it's also not unrealistic to be asked to do that in the real world. Uh, I've been asked to design things um, without knowing how I was going to do them. <laughs> Which isn't the best case scenario, but sometimes it happens. So what you generally do in a case like that is you study the problem enough to get sort of an idea of what you need to do, and then you just take a shot from there. And this class is relatively easy because the unknowns are, are, are the, the stuff that we have not covered in this class are pretty straightforward. Namely, we haven't really covered how to make updates to the database, which we're going to start talking about today. All right. Um, but just have faith that by the time, you know, within the next couple weeks or so, you will learn how to update a database using um, ASP.NET pages. So you kind of have to accept that as faith when you're doing your design. All right, so kind of to summarize this, what day is today, the 25th, right? The assignment that was due on the 27th was pushed to November 1st, I believe. Your design, this is lab something or other. Um, your design for the project is now due on November 8th, and you have a new lab that is due November 10th. All right. And next week we probably will have a few. Next week we will probably take the opportunity to have some working days where we just time for people to catch up and time for people to um, ask questions and if anything else work on their design. Um, this is sort of a revised schedule. Um, this is sort of the revised part. I mentioned that I was mistaken, I think, in one of my announcements when I said the design was due next week. It's actually due the following day. It's actually due on election day. Oh, boy. And if any of you need to turn it in the following day because you're voting on election day, by all means do. Damn it. I can't use that as an issue. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Damn it. Well, I don't know your citizenship. So you, you could be a citizen. I don't know. Yeah, I mean... You know, I mean, you, you could be. I don't know. You could still use that as an excuse. You could, you could say you have to file a, a absentee ballot uh, in the Denmarkian election. Uh, I'd have to, I can say that I uh, have to be cultural educated, so I wanted to go see how it worked. That, excellent idea. You wanted to be, uh, yeah, you wanted to observe the beautiful election process. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, okay, your design for your project, just to review. The biggest piece of the design is the database design. You know, think of the database as the foundation on which everything else is built. And 
You know, if you build something with a weak foundation, it's not going to hold. If you build something with a strong foundation, then you can build on top of it. So that's the big thing to get right. So ask me stuff about that. I, I made some comments. People have turned in the database assignment. I have made some comments concerning their database. Um, make sure you have the relationships right. That is, the relationships in terms of the cardinality of the relationships. One to many, many to many, and so on. That's, that's a big one in, in defining the database right. In addition to that in the design, write a little paragraph that simply describes, or a couple paragraphs that describes what it does, and then dis, uh, um, describe um, what pages you're going to have. Making sure that your pages fit the, the, the criteria that's defined. For example, I say a parameterized query. Make sure you have a parameterized query sometime. A search would be an example of a parameterized query. In other words, with a search, you put in some criteria, and that criteria is used to get search results. So you might pick from a drop-down something and then display every record from the database that meets that criteria. Um, or you might have a text box. Whatever makes sense for your situation, that's a parameterized qu uh, query. A header detail I talk about in the design document that is where you have a row from a database table, and you have a set of rows that are related to that row. An example of that from the homework would be where we have a movie, and then we have a list of actors that appeared in that movie. So that's a header in detail. You have the one row that's sort of the driver, the main row, and then you have related uh, rows for it. Then you need to be able to insert, update, and delete, and then there's other things. So make sure you have covered all of the, all of the um, um, criteria that's listed in the design. Another thing to keep in mind is you don't have to create a comprehensive solution. You just have to solve one particular aspect of the problem. For example, let's talk about the poll example that I'm doing now. right? A comprehensive solution, the one that we're doing in class, a comprehensive solution would have um, me define uh, an a administrator mode where you could go in and add questions and answers to the database. All right? If I was developing this application, I would create that, uh, an admin mode, where certain users were defined as admin, and an admin could go in and maintain the question and answer database. All right. Now, I may not do that for the example. I may or may not. It depends on how far we go and how fast we, we proceed. So, like, if that was your project, which it shouldn't be, you're not allowed to copy my project as yours, all right? But if that were your project, it would be perfectly acceptable for you to say, I'm going to handle the user voting and reporting in my database, but I'm not going to worry about administrator mode where you go in and you have the ability to define questions. That we can just go in through access and, and enter the questions through access um, table maintenance or something like that. So that is acceptable. So you don't have to write a comprehensive solution. Pick one aspect of a problem and make sure you solve that. All right? Uh, again, it, it's a matter of scope. You know, this, this, you know, with this class, you don't have unlimited time to work on this. You know, it's only part of the class. And therefore, I'm not asking you to do everything about a problem. But the part of the problem that you do address, I want you to address it well. All right? So I'd rather have a narrow scope. In other words, you're only solving a small part of the problem, but you're doing an extremely good job solving that part of the problem than try to address everything that you could possibly think of relating to your problem and only touch on, on, on the surface of that. If you have any specific questions, by all means, ask me about that. Any questions now? Yeah. All right. Maintaining a database. We're going to talk a little bit about the ASP.NET side of it. We're then going to talk about the SQL side of it, and then we'll get in and we'll actually write some code and, and do it. There's actually two ways, well, there's probably a million ways, right? But 
two ways that you can maintain a database is number one, through the build-in ASP.NET controls for data. That is, you can use a grid view. And you can put a little edit link. And a delete link in your grid view. So you can use a grid view to maintain a set of rows in the database. With a grid view, the grid view itself does not have a built-in insert into it. So you'd have to do an insert some other way. All right? So you could use a grid view to do that. And you could use a details view also. So this might be name, email, city, state. So you could maintain a, row, a set of rows, or you could maintain an individual row. Name, email, city, state. Now, with the details view, you have the option to also do an insert as well. You can do an insert with a details view where you cannot with a grid view. We will call this the, we will call, we will call using these the ASP.NET controls approach. Now, this isn't some kind of official name, but I just want a shorthand that I can refer to this. So when I say this approach, you understand what I'm talking about. So this is a me term. This isn't um, a universal term. We can use these. Now, and, and then there's a second approach. The second approach is custom coding. And in custom coding, you would construct your own form. knowing how 
how these approaches work, the details of them, without with just getting an overview of these. What do you suppose the respective advantages and disadvantages are? Well, no code um, sounds like it's going to go pretty quickly. Um, okay. Because you just have to drag and drop and select whatever you want to show. Okay. Code is going to take a little bit while, but you have a lot more control over what you're doing. Exactly. This is this is a classic um, situation that you have in a lot of uh, programming. You have a you have a framework that does something, or you can go off roading and write your own code to do it. Now, when do you take which approach? Well, the answer is it depends, right? If you have a very cookie cutter type pro uh, problem, all right. If you have a very straightforward problem, all right, nothing difficult, nothing weird about it. You're just having people enter in, you know, their customer information to register for the site. So you might have some text boxes, you might have a drop down, you might have you might have validation, all right? But if you have a very cookie cutter problem, then the no code approach is a decent approach. It gets the job done and it does it well. You know, it, it, it accomplishes a job, and it does it without um, you having to spend time coding it, right? That's a good thing. That's the whole reason we use frameworks, right? Is to give us a, a head start at coding something, right? If you remember back from the first day of class, when we talked about frameworks, we defined them as, as something that you can build upon, something that does part of the job for you, and then you can do the rest of the job, either by configuring it or by writing the parts that are distinct to your particular problem. Now, the code approach is flipped. All right. What if you don't have a cookie cutter sort of problem? What if you have something that's a little bit unusual? And we'll talk about that, what some of the unusual conditions are in our example in a minute here. All right. But what if you have something that you really want a high degree of control over, or maybe that does something that's a little different than the standard uh, behavior of the framework? Well, you can always write the code yourself. All right, that's always an option. All right, it's important to learn like how to make that call. Right. It's important to learn how to make that call because if you always write the code, then you're probably spending too much time coding. If you're always using the no-code version, then you're missing a lot of flexibility that your application could have. So a good developer will understand the framework thoroughly enough to know when it's good to use it and when it's good not to use it. All right? The framework has a way of doing things, all right? And for some situations, that's perfectly acceptable. If you have a situation that does not meet that criteria, though, your two options are to try to tweak the framework to get it to do what you want, or to just look and say, well, I'm not going to use a framework in this case. I am just going to uh, write the code myself. That's why it's important to know both approaches so you can make a, a, an intelligent call on this. Now, here's what's unusual about our case. Voting. All right? If you remember, we have, let's imagine what our voting screen is going to look like in our poll application. our table look like for votes? There is a question ID. A user ID. I'll pull 
put them in the same order. There's a user ID, there's a question ID, and there's an answer ID. Yeah, it's not a, it's a sequence number, right? It's not an answer ID. And this is a foreign key over to the answer table. And this is a foreign key over to the user table. All right. Now, let's imagine how we want the voting to work. Manually go 
going to enter all the fields. For example, if we had a customer registration page where we had the email address, password, name, other properties, where we're creating a new customer or user row in our user table, and we are manually entering in all of the fields except for maybe the auto number. The auto number we don't need to enter. But everything else we're manually entering in. This kind of scenario, a details view would work perfectly. And we wouldn't have to write any code. This kind of scenario here, where, mo where some of the data, in fact most of the data, comes from other places. There's only a tiny piece of the data that we're entering in on this form. All right? For this approach, for this to try to shoehorn it into the framework would probably be more work than just writing the whole thing ourselves. Right? So therefore, we're going to write it ourselves. So in a nutshell, entering a vote in our poll application doesn't fit easily into the framework of a grid view and a data view because data is coming from a couple different places, from three places. One piece of data is coming from the query string, one piece of data is coming from a session variable, and one piece of data is entered on the screen. The details view and grid view work best when everything is just entered by the user. The user just goes in and enters first field through last field. Could you do the voting using a grid view and a detail view? You absolutely could. All right? Is that effort going to be worth it? No. Sometimes it's better just to do it yourself and custom code it. So for this reason, we're going to do some examples using the code way and some of the examples using the no code way. All right? And this particular first example of voting, we're going to handle using the code approach. All right, where we're going to write the code to do that. Now, what are the SQL statements used to add rows to a database table, to change rows in a database table, and to get rid of rows in a database table? Okay, I think I heard the first one. Answer. Answer. What about to change rows? Update. Update. And what about to delete rows? Delete. I shouldn't have said the word delete there, should I? <laughs> These are the three statements I'm going to use. All right? That we're going to use eventually. Our first focus is going to be on the insert. All right? Now, how many rows can you, how many tables can you update with a single insert statement? <clears throat> One. Single insert statement works on one table. All right. In fact, all of these work on one table with a little catch. And we'll come to that catch when we talk about deletes. All right. What does an insert statement look like? There's actually a couple forms of the insert statement. It's kind of like Pokemon or something where there's different forms of it or whatever. But we're going to focus on one of the forms. And the forms for the general form for the insert statement that we're going to use is insert into table. So I'll use the vote table. All right. User ID, um, question ID and sequence number. Values and what are the values are? We don't know. They're parameters, right? It depends on who's voting, what question they're voting on, and what answer they The insert statement, we're going to leave those blank. 
All right, we're going to put question marks there. And we have to tell, we have to tell um, where to get those from. All right? And again, in this particular case, this is coming from the session ID or the session variable. This is coming from the query string. And this is going to be user input. Okay. Some syntax errors that are common with this that you need to be aware of. Number one, making sure that the number of values match up with the number of columns. So if you list four columns, you need to have four values. If you don't have four values, you, um, you, you know, it's going to blow up. So I'm talking about syntax errors here, errors that will, will blow up as soon as you try and run it. All right. Second thing is the data types of fields. If you try to stuff a string into the user ID and the user ID is numeric, you're going to have a problem. You know, if you try to stuff the email address in there instead or the name, instead of the session, uh, instead of the, the, the user ID. All right. This can sometimes happen if you define the parameters in, in the different order than you define the columns. All right. We'll show you how to define the parameters in a, in a, in a bit here. But in this case, we are not going to have that problem potentially because those, these three fields are all numbers. But if you have a mix of fields that are numeric and string, if when you define the list of parameters, you like get things in the wrong order, all right, then you can have a case where uh, an insert's gonna fail because it tries to put a string in a numeric field. Other kinds of syntax errors, again, you get the name of the table wrong, you get the name of a column wrong, your table name or column name is a reserved word, all right? For example, if you had a table name select, right? Select means something specific in the SQL language. So first of all, it's probably not a good idea to use that as a name. If you did happen to use a, a, a field a name or a table name that was a reserved word, you can put square brackets around it. You can actually always put square brackets around it, just to be extra careful. So those are kind of the basic syntax errors that you can get with these, with, with these inserts. What are other errors that you could get running a, uh, a, 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 an insert statement that is not, that are not example of syntax errors? In other words, I type the statement in correctly. My parameters are Correct. What are some other errors I could get doing an insert? Yes? Under inserting maybe the same user ID or something? Or exactly. Uh, and I'll lump all those into one general category, even though there's a couple of uh, different variations of it. I could be, my insert statement could violate the constraints of the table, the database constraints of the table. Now, what does that mean? In the vote table, for example, the user ID, question ID, and sequence number are all required. All right? So if I omitted one of those, or if I had a null value for one of those, then I would get an error. If I remember right, the primary key to this table is a user ID and a question ID. So if I try to put in the same person for the same question, it's going to blow up. Lastly, I don't think I was able to actually create it due to a limitation of access, but question ID and sequence number ought to be a foreign key. And therefore, if there was not a match for that sequence number and question ID, it would be a violation. Now, We've seen how ASP.NET handles errors, right? It handles errors pretty ugly. And therefore, one of the things we're going to want to learn to do is to write our own error 
processing so that we can give better looking error messages. I talked too much SQL, so we'll leave update and delete for another day. All right. But a lot of the things that I said about the insert are going to be true about the update and delete. Namely, for the most part, they only work on one table. There can be syntax errors the same way if you know you have an invalid name or something. Or if you try to uh, violate a constraint in the database, it will blow up. All right, so let's go and let's try to make our vote page. Oh, by the way, I, I know what I wanted to say at the beginning of class. If you remember, in class the one time recently, I got an error trying to put um, stuff on a master page, stuff on a page clone from a master page. I tried to look into that, and I did not have the problem when I tried to do it on my machine. So I don't know what that tells you. Uh, I'll, I'll try looking at that today and see. I'll try looking at that right now and see if we still have the same problem. And then we'll get into the inserts. I did have to go and delete the SQL data source and recreate it. I don't know if that's where the issue was or what. But let's go in here. on default on ASPX. Notice how that says unnamed. That kind of bothers me. So I went in and deleted it. I 
and I created a new. data source, use the connection we've been using. I'm going to cheat and use the quick way. We can go and pick poll this way. And then I went in and Selected the data source for this and ran it and it worked. And there we go. So I don't know why it didn't work before. But it seemed like if you get something along these lines, seemed like deleting the data source, recreating it, seemed to get it to work. All right. I'm going to add to this the, the link to vote. All right. So since we got this working now, I'm going to go and add to this the link to vote, and I'm going to create my vote page um, that way. All right. So. How do we create a link? Well, you can go here, edit the columns, and we can say I want a hyperlink field. Now, for this one, I'm just going to have the word vote. All right, I'm not going to display the, the name of the question or anything like that. I'm going to put the word vote here. Um, it's a little bit different than the ones we did before, but I'm going to put vote. I'm still going to need the data navigate URL fields because the first page needs to tell the second page what question you're voting on. So the way that it's going to do that is it's going to pass it on the query string. And therefore, the field that it's passing on the query string is the poll ID. How are we formatting the URL for that? Well, we want the URL to be vote.aspx, then we want the query string. And we want to pass ID equals, and I'm going to do curly brace zero, curly brace. What does that represent? That represents a placeholder where we're going to put that first parameter, where we're going to put that data navigate URL fields. In our case, we only have one, and remember, the numbering starts with zero. So I click OK. I now have a link that says vote, and when I run this, as I either view source or hover my mouse over it, notice that down there it says vote ASPX ID equals one, vote ASPX ID equals two. All right. So now let's make the vote page. And the vote page should show, let's add some things to the vote page. We're going to add to the vote page um, the, um, the name of the person. All right. We're going to add to the vote page the text of the question that they're voting on, and then we're going to have radio buttons for the options. 
and then we're going to have a button to go and cast your vote. So let's go and let's build that. Actually, that's another thing that I did last time. One of these pages here, I was having a problem doing the proper null test. I finally got that. Yeah. So I'm going to copy that snippet of code. Might as well have every page display the display the name of the person. I'm going to go and drag my label over here. I think I call that LBL full name. And I can go in the master page and I could put code in the page load event for the master page. Alright. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook the login page to the master page. I mean to the to the default page. So let's open this guy up. If they've successfully logged on, I'm going to redirect them to default.aspx. And I'm going to set login as my start page. Alright, let's run this guy. Username and password, M. Zellers. Wait a minute, that's supposed to be my email address. At LorraineCCC.edu. And my password, I believe, is just password. And there it shows my full name, indicating I'm logged on, and I have the link to vote. So I'm going to make the voting page. And I'm going to inherit from the master page, so I don't have to worry about putting the logic for the name in there. All right. Um, and then I'm going to do the rest of the stuff. All right. So let's go and make the voting page. Again, notice as I'm doing this, you know, this is definitely a case of me practicing what I preach. All right. This voting page, I'm not going to try to write the entire voting page all at once. I'm going to do it a little piece at a time. What are the things that the voting page needs to do? It needs to show the question. It needs to show the possible answers. It needs to have a button to click on it. Uh, more so than just showing the answers, it needs to be a uh, way of selecting your answer. So there needs to be a radio buttons or a drop down or something. Now, I could write, and, and then when I select the button, it actually has to generate the SQL. Well, I could do this, and I could try to do this in one fell swoop, but instead I'm going to do this a piece at a time. So, let me go in and create a new page. Called Vote. And select master page. I'm going to put two SQL data sources on this page. 
one for to, to get the value of the question to display, and one to get the value of the answer that I'm going to display. So, right now I'm going to display the question in a detailed view, and I'm going to display the answers in a grid view. Why am I doing that? Because that's what we know how to do, right? Um, I think a good way to approach a problem is to analyze the pieces of the problem that you know how to do, and then look at the pieces of the problem that you don't know how to do. So we know how to do part of this problem. We know how to display the question and display the options. The two pieces that we haven't done before are number one, displaying the options as a radio button or a drop down or something like that. But if we think about it, it probably won't be much different than this, right? Because in all these cases, we have a data source and we have a way of visually representing that in the user interface. So my guess is, is that to do this is not going to be that different than doing um, a grid view. But we'll find that out. The other thing, the bigger piece that we haven't done, is the actual insert statement. But, I love the little sound effects. But, ta-da, but we have written code to do SQL statements before. That's the good news of this. So it's almost like identify the pieces of the problem that you know, identify the pieces of the problem that you don't know, look to see if there are things that you know how to do that are similar to the things that you don't know how to do. So that's sort of how I've analyzed this in my head going forward, or how if I were doing this for the first time, how I would do that. I know how to do a SQL data source and a, a details view and a grid view. All right. I don't know how to make radio buttons that show values from a SQL statement. I don't know how to write a SQL statement to do the insert. But I've written code for a SQL statement before, so maybe this will be similar to that. And the notion of binding is that we can take data and bind it to something visual. So if I can bind it to a grid view, maybe I can bind it to a radio button. All right. That's my hope, anyhow. All right. So let me go and configure these data sources. The first one is going to say, select star from poll where poll ID equals question mark. Were we getting that value of the question mark? It rhymes with Mary Spring query string. And what's the name of the field? It's ID. Let's test this. Terry Frank, right. Maybe that'll be the answer to the next one. And that works. I'm going to bind my details view to this. Then I'm going to configure my second SQL data source. Connection string. Now, here's a, there's a count. I'm going to use the, the quick SQL generator here. Um, we know we want to pull from the answers table. Pull ID, sequence number, and answer text. We only want to display the answer text, right? But I'm also going to select those other columns. Why? Well, Really, the only other one I would probably need to select would be sequence number. I'm not going to display the sequence number, but my code is going to need the sequence number. Therefore, I better select it if I'm going to need it. And I'm going to select the poll ID just for good measure. I don't have to display it, but I'm just going to select it. Where poll ID equals 
from the query string ID. Remember to click Add. I can test this query. And there we go. Now we go to run this. I didn't buy them. Thank you. Choose data source. SQL data source 2. Alrighty. Now I'm going to start debugging. And I type in mzellers, so maybe, at Lorraine. CCC.edu, password of password. I click login. I get this. I click on vote. And I see this. All right. Again, how do I want to put this? Don't underestimate like the psychological advantage of being able to leave the day with something working, even though it's not completely working yet. All right. That really, truly is a benefit because you know, you know what you need to do now. If I tried to do everything and it blew up on me, I might not have any idea what was wrong. All right, and I would have to scratch my head and think and so on. Whereas at the very least, it's like, yeah, I've made progress in the right direction. I've made demonstrable progress in the right direction. All right, so let's go and let's try to make it make even more progress. So, we really don't need the grid view. What we need is a radio button group. So I'm going to get rid of the grid view. Maybe. There we go. And I'm going to drag on here a radio button group. Or radio button list, I'm sorry. And let me arrange that. That radio button list should be below the question. Oops. Now, why did I pick a radio button list instead of a radio button? Because a radio button list means more than one radio button. My options are going to be more than one radio button. It's not going to be a single radio button. And what's more, I want those radio buttons to work as a unit. So therefore, if you're pulling options from a database to form a radio button, you want it to be a radio button list because you want one button for each option, and you want those buttons to work as a unit. So if I pick one, it, un it, it unpicks the other. So I'm going to go and click, and I'm going to choose data source. Gee, my wish came true. I can bind this just like I could bind, um, just like I could bind the grid view, right? And you'll see that's kind of the case, right, as you go through these. You'll see that most visual things have the ability to bind them to a database field, all right? And that's sort of the a strength of the framework, right, is that, you know, um, the notion of data binding means that you have your data in one place and your visual display in another. And you can change the way that visually it's displayed without having to worry about retrieving the data. So, for example, if I did this first with radio buttons and decided that a drop-down was better, it would be trivial to change to change it. Right? I just need to replace the radio button group with the drop down. I wouldn't have to change the way that the data is being retrieved. So pick data source, SQL data source 2. I now have two things to choose. I want the data field to display. Well, what do I want to show? I want to show. The answer text. I don't know why it's not there. <coughs> And what's the data field? It's got to be the sequence number. 
that's what I want to store sort of behind the scenes is a sequence number. That's what I'm going to need in my SQL statement. So now let's go and run it. And with any luck, the wrong screen. I was going to say, where did they go? But all right, I got to click the button. There we go. And voila. There we go. All right. Yay. All right. Okay. We could probably get rid of that details view at the top, too, because that looks kind of clunky. It would be nice if it was just like the text that showed that. But we'll leave that for another day. But the principle is going to be the same. We're going to put something else there instead of, we could, for example, put a read-only uh, text box. Or we might be able to put a label. I'm not sure you can bind a label to the database, though. I'd have to check that out. All right. So we are ready to go. Let's look at the source. It's always important to view the source to make sure that we're generating the code that we think we're generating. wanted to be sure of is that this had the right value, the radio button, and it looks like red button, red bull does have a value of one, which I believe is the right value for it, and monster has a value of two, and so on. All right, so now we're going to put the button on, and we're going to try to write the SQL statement. Um, I am going to do what I can to get through um, this example completely, and if I have to rush, we will talk about it um, next time. We'll, we'll go and review this. So anyhow, I'm going to go and I'm going to add a button onto this guy. And my code behind? Well, gee, where to start? Hmm. Login seems like a good place to start. I'm going to copy. Okay, which is a safe bet because hey, I still have to create my SQL data source, right? because that's sort of the pipeline of my database. I'm connecting to the same database, so I would think the connection string is going to be the same. I have a SQL command, but guess what? My SQL command isn't a select statement. What kind of command is it? It's an insert command. What's my insert command? It is, we had it up on the screen a minute ago, Insert into vote. Is it vote or votes? Vote. vote. And we have a 
user ID, poll ID, uh, sequest over, thank you. And what are the values? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Now, I'm putting those question marks in. You might think, couldn't I just put the values in? At this point, I know what the values are, right? I know that the value of the first thing is coming from the session variable. I know the value of the second thing is coming from the, the, the query string. And I know the value of the third thing is coming from the radio button. So the question is, could I just put those things in there? And the answer is, you could, but it's not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? Well, the parameter object actually does stuff for you. So notice here we're adding to the select parameters. We're going to add to the insert parameters instead. By putting things in a parameters object, it makes our application more secure. There are things uh, that hackers do called SQL injection attacks, where they take and they try to manipulate data input to insert SQL statements into uh, a database uh, and try to execute, uh, uh, what would I say, um, uh, malicious SQL statements by coding them actually into the input boxes of, of forms. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a way, uh, in addition, but if you had a name, let's say we had a name like uh, O. Donahue, where the name was O apostrophe Donahue, that apostrophe means something to SQL, all right? So the process of like taking care of those things and cleaning up the data is called sanitizing your inputs, all right? You're making it safe for the database to try and execute it. Writing your own code to sanitize inputs is a pain, all right? We had to do that in old school ASP, prior to ASP.net. And it was one of those things that we constantly found things that we forgot about and had to go back in and add, and, and, and it got to really be a pain. I mean, we came up with a solution to it, but we spent more time on it than we wanted to. Well, if you use the SQL parameters, which that's what this does, then you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to use insert parameters, and I'm going to specify where these things come from. Now the user ID comes from Except it's not full name, it is. I have to look at what I called it when I logged in. Do, 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 do. I called it user ID, cleverly enough. So user ID. And the next one is poll ID. That comes from request query string what's the name of the field? It's ID and then the last one for sequence number is I want the sequence no to come from my radio buttons. And what was my radio button called? Radio button list one dot selected value. 
All right. At this point, we've simply prepped the SQL statement. We've connected to the database and we've said, this is our insert statement. All right. We now have to go and actually execute that insert statement. So objds dot insert no arguments required. That's what does the insert statement. All right. Insert statements in a way, insert update and delete statements in a way are simpler than a query because an insert statement either succeeds or fails, right? A query can have a, a number of, of results. It could return one row, it could return ten rows, it could return zero rows, and so on. So with the SQL statement, with a, with a SQL select statement, you have to account for the fact that you might be retrieving all pull rows. With an insert, you run it, it either works or it doesn't. So there's no looping involved with an insert statement, typically for a simple insert statement. So let's test this and see if it works. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to go, and we're out of time for today, we'll pick this up on Thursday. If it does work, I'm going to gloat for a while, and then I'll say the same thing, except I'll say it did work. We'll see you on Thursday. There's a third option. Is that when you have to like, disable the vote? Yeah, I, 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 I should. There's a couple things I could do. At the very least, I should, um, I should handle the error better than this. Let me just go in because I'm now prepared to talk about error processing today. We don't have time for that. Let me go in and clear out the vote table. Yep, there we go. But yeah, um, at the very least, I should, I should display a user-friendly message. I could do other things, like if I got to that page, I could say, you have already voted, tough luck, or whatever. And we could talk about that going, going forward in a future class. But today, I just want to make sure the insert worked. All right, so I've cleared out all the votes. So any vote that comes in now is a result of my page. So I will run it. I will log in. How could I make it so I don't have to log in each time? Yeah, store a cookie. Um, a cookie serves the role of, of remembering things between sessions. All right, the session variable remembers something within a session. A cookie is a little file that's stored on the client side that could be used. And the login page could look to see if that cookie existed. If it did, pull in and essentially re-log me in. All right. Kickstart. I press the button. All right. Did it work? I don't know. Probably I should change this so after I vote it, it takes me back to that default page. Let's make sure it worked though. Hey, it did. Let's delete it. 
change it again. And how do I redirect it? Well, after this, I can say response. Redirect. And I can send it to the fall by ASPX. Last time, I promise. For today, that is.